so thank you so much for having me. My name is Lola Kimade Orkestrom. I'm an author and travel photographer based in Stockholm, Sweden. I'm originally from Nigeria. And with my work, I love exploring culture through food, tradition and lifestyle. So I'm a visual storyteller. When did you first start getting into photography? Was that something that you've always shown an interest in and always had a passion in? So photography kind of came about by accident, right? So I've always been a traveler. I love to travel. I was a writer first. So when I traveled, I wrote. And then I just took pictures so that I could come back and paint from those pictures because I was an oil painter. And so I did that for many years until I realized, hmm, am I duplicating work, you know, by taking these photos and then painting them? And so I started exploring, you know, photography as another platform for creative expression. And so that's kind of how I think over the last 12 years, I started getting into photography, you know, uh, seriously as a travel photographer. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about your childhood and growing up because you grew up in Nigeria. Is that yes. right? Yes. Yes. So I grew up in Nigeria. Um, uh, Yoruba, so from the uh, Yoruba tribe. And in Nigeria, we have about 250 different tribes speaking over 500 different languages and dialects. And so culture has always been just in my DNA. I love culture. I love exploring the nuances of culture, what makes us different, what makes us similar. And so I grew up in Nigeria t- till I was 15 and moved to the U.S. for school. So that's where I went to college, you know, worked for many years in a very technical field as a programmer and system architect until I decided to switch careers and become a visual storyteller within the travel industry. And so that love for culture and growing up in kind of really strong cultures permeates all my work because I focus on exploring culture through lifestyle, through through, uh, preservation of tradition, through slow uh, indigenous food. So that kind of, you know, informs the work I do today. When did you first start traveling? So in in the UK, it's quite popular after you finish school at 18 to sort of take a gap year and spend 12 months, you know, traveling around the world, backpacking. Is that something that you've done? Or or when did travel start to become sort of um, a part of your life? Yeah, so I've actually been traveling since I was barely one year old, right? So I come from a traveling family. My grandfather was in, in the shipping industry. He traveled a lot. And my father was a ge- is a geologist, and um, he traveled a lot. And so exploration and just kind of exploring other places has always been in my culture. So I traveled a lot when I was younger. And then I started getting into solo travel, you know, not so much taking a year backpacking, but maybe taking a couple weeks here or, you know, a long weekend there. And then I just started traveling and finding my own rhythm and style of exploring, you know, different places and learning about different places. So, yeah. You talked about finding your own rhythm and style of, of traveling and exploring. Could you share a little bit more about what that's like? Because um, I believe you're, you're sort of quite um, a slow traveler. Yes, yes. And so when I say slow travel, people always think uh, uh, about slow travel as the duration, you know, of time you spend in a place. But for me, slow travel is actually about the pace at which I explore a place. So I could be a slow traveler and spend two days in a place, you know. And what that means is exploring that place based on a very specific interest, one theme, one thread that gets you deeper into the culture than trying to explore all the main sites or all the things you have to check off. So for me, you know, if I say, okay, I love, um, you know, culture, I love working with artisans, Then I'm going to spend my time trying to learn or get to know local artisans, you know, go find out where they are, where they're creating stuff with their hands. Or if I say I want to explore the food culture of a place, instead of kind of eating everything the food is, uh, the place is known for, you know, and checking off a list, I actually maybe go to a fish market, go out with a fisherman, you know, come in with the fish that they catch, see where they're selling it and learn more about the food culture from a really kind of rudimentary, fundamental way. So that's what I mean is when I found my own rhythm for travel, it's anything that has to do with kind of that cultural aspect of a place. And then I pick one of it and explore from that angle. 
Oh my God, I love that. I think that's amazing. <laughs> like, especially like how you described it, you know, going to the fish market, meeting the fisherman, going out with him to catch the fish and almost just like following that process through. Although yes. in, in my head, I, it's going through all the way to the plate and eating it at, um, <laughs> eating yeah, it at no, dinner somewhere. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, I, and I've done that in many places around the world and it's an amazing, amazing experience. <laughs> You headed over to America and, and you got your, you went to college over there and you sort of worked in quite um, like an intense field, like uh, information systems. But then you decide to make the transition to, to follow your passions. How easy was it to make that transition? Had you saved up money beforehand? Did you know it was something that you were going to do? You know, how did it come about? So I've always known that travel uh, was always going to be in my future. I just didn't know how. And so when I actually worked in a technical field, I worked in a field called Geographic Information Systems, GIS. So think about like interactive maps, like Geo- like Google Maps and stuff like that, developing those kinds of systems. So there was already that element of geography and travel, you know, with the work I did as a programmer. But it wasn't until tw- 2002, so that's 18 years ago, um, I volunteered with an expedition race in Fiji, and the race at the time was called the Eco Challenge. And what they did was there were people that were tired of Ironman competitions came to do this <laughs> crazy uh, expedition. And so there were countries, tra- you know, people representing different countries traversing different, you know, terrains, going into some of the most remote parts of Fiji. And so for those three weeks. I got to explore and follow those people, you know, kind of into those remote parts. And then my job was to write about it, share some photographs and post this on the website every day. And so that was at the moment I realized, oh, my goodness, there is a career like this. There is this kind of career of where you just travel the world, write what you're experiencing, share it with the world through your own words and photos. And so when I got back, that was when I started plotting, you know, the way I was going to leave my life as a programmer. But I didn't just jump away right away. I started freelancing on the side while I still worked as a programmer. And I did that for at least two, three years until I felt like I was getting enough traction to swan dive, you know, (laughs) directly into travel writing and, and travel photography. And just one more point about that is, remember, you're going from a very steady income, pretty much high paying job, diving into the life of a starving artist Unless you have the passion and the will, it's a very difficult thing to do. And so that transition was a painful one because it was pretty much like a 60 to 80, 70% income cut right away. But then over time, you know, that's been rebuilt, you know, and, uh, and I'm, I'm in a much better place as well. But that was kind of my route. You know, I walked on the side and then when I felt like I was getting some traction, then I did the, the swan dive into it. I think it's all too easy sometimes for people to look and and to look at photographers and travel writers and think, oh, it's so easy. They just travel the world and take (laughs) photos and write some stories and and they'll get paid money. And the reality of, you know, building up your own business and, you know, getting your commissions and getting paid and getting the jobs and the work and balancing everything is very, very different from getting, you know, when you get, I used to work in banking. So (laughs) when you used to get like a regular paycheck every month, the way you know sort of not really depend on how hard you work but you know just showing up then you know doing the hours that you need to do so I really appreciate you you sharing that and one of the things that you did as well is you volunteered as like a photo journalist with the Swedish Red Cross and World Hope International and yes and so, oh, yeah sorry please tell us more about those experiences <laughs> no so that was you know kind of earlier on you know when I was still trying to figure out what part of um you know photography I really wanted to explore because I am a at art, I'm a human geographer. I am. Um, it's all about connections for me. So I was wondering, okay, was I going to be a photojournalist? Was I going to go that route? You know, before was I going to go kind of the more travel, you know, experience route? So in the beginning, you know, I did uh, volunteer with the Swedish Red Cross, you know, and and I still love volunteering with, um, you know, nonprofit organizations as well. So, but that's what I did. And then with World Up, I uh, volunteered with them in Cambodia and Nicaragua, you know, and so, so I also love doing that. That's uh, something I wish I did more of, you know, as well. With the countries that you're that you're visiting and the and and you know and taking the photos and the images, are you going in 
with an idea of the type of image that you want to collect or like how do you know when you've got the shot or you've got the photo like how does that work for you correct so for me it really depends on why i'm there so if i'm being set on a sent on assignment then i have a general idea of what i'm trying to create or what i'm trying to capture but when it comes to people i really go for the kind of organic connection and for me even though I shoot everything as a travel photographer, because as a travel photographer, you have to shoot everything to capture a sense of place. My preference is environmental portraits of people. And so that is people shots kind of in their natural environment, in their domain. And for me, there's a moment when I take the photo, I see it in the eyes of the person where there's that connection, where we are both seeing each other at the same time. Those are the shots I live for. Um, is when I take that shot of the person so that when the viewer sees that shot, you are truly looking into the eyes of the person. You are seeing the person for who they are instead of judging them based on their environment. So that those are the kinds of shots I go for. And there's a moment I know when I get the shot because I see it in the eyes when we're just looking at each other fully and the, the outside world is shut off. How did you go about getting your photos in like the National Geographic and the BBC Travel and Lonely Planet? And, you, you know, you've, you've had them appear in you know, all sorts of publications. How did you how did you build those connections and get the photos in those, you know, those places? Yes. So it's, it's kind of twofold. Right. So when I was taking photos, I, I, you know, I realized as a travel photo, photographer, I need to capture as many different kinds of photos of a place to tell a story of the place. Because one of the mistakes I see is a lot of travel photographers just choose one specialty and stay in that specialty. They say, okay, I'm a landscape photographer, so all I bring back are landscapes. But the problem is, as beautiful and epic as a landscape is, it doesn't tell the full story of a place, right? So if you can bring a mixture of photos, then you can be able to start creating sellable photos, a story of a place. Now, once you've got those photos, then it's easier to pitch a story of a place to a publication. And so with National Geographic, how that started was they used to run a community called the Your Shot. I think it's been shuttered now. I don't think they still like do it, but they they run a, a community called Your Shot where people just created free accounts and they uploaded their photos. And every day the editors picked their daily dozen, so their daily favorite photos out of thousands of photos. And so when I started putting my photos there, I think I made that daily dozen at least three times. And so for me, that meant that my photos were saying something. That means there was some kind of visual voice to my photos for them to be able to pick it out and say it's one of them. So that's how I started. So that gave me confidence to then pitch to the editors or, you know, or to say, oh, I have this story I want to pitch. And then I was very audacious because a lot of photographers are nervous. They feel like, oh, it's BBC. I can't really pitch. I have never been published anywhere else. It doesn't matter. If you have a strong story and if you know how to tell that story well, that's what the editors are going to see. They're not going to see that, oh, you're a photographer that hasn't been published yet. So very early on, I was extremely audacious. I was pitching people that I was probably not supposed to be pitching. But what's the best thing that could happen? They respond to your email. The worst thing is they just ignore your email. But then what happens when the best thing happens? And that happened a couple times. So again, that's my advice is, one, start creating collections of sto- that can tell stories about a place, not just kind of food or just landscape or just one. And two, be audacious and be able to pitch those stories to those publications I love how you how you look at that because most people would almost go straight away and I think it's something that I would do oh well what's the worst that could happen and actually what you said is well what's the best thing that could happen instead of you know what's the worst thing and I I just love that way of of looking at it yes traveling is it's an incredible thing to be able to do it's you know it's an amazing privilege to to get out there to explore more of the world and especially as a solo female traveler you know, sometimes there will be challenging situations that you end up in. Could you maybe share one of those experiences which has been particularly challenging for you for whatever reason and how you overcame that challenge? So I think it's, um, so I have the added 
layer of being black, right? So I'm a black woman that travels, and in some parts of the world, there's already stereotypes of black women. So there are some places where if I'm moving, you know, through as a photographer, it's either people approach me, maybe they assume I'm a prostitute, you know, and so they approach me from that kind of aggressive angle, or I may sometimes not get access to the places I need to get to because the people are prejudiced and feel like I shouldn't be in this luxury lodge, <laughs> you know. So that is one aspect of it. And then the other aspect is you can also become a novelty. So places where they don't see many black people, then people are stopping you every second and asking for selfies. That happened a lot in Uzbekistan. So for me, it's always about navigating intent. And I actually wrote a really kind of deep opinion piece about this for British Airways recently that talked about how I travel as a black woman and how I decode the different stares I get. And then how I also decode the intention of the person because most people are just curious about you. They want to know, you know, they want to know where you're from. And then some people based on stereotypes approach you from that. So it's a, it's a, it's another emotional layer when navigating the world. And then of course, navigating the world as a professional travel photo photographer who happens to be black, you know, there's that layer of when my colleagues, maybe my white male colleagues get easy access, I may not get as much access to the same resources. So there's so lots of things to <laughs> to juggle. It just sounds exhausting, like trying to, you know, em- emotionally exhausting, having to, you know, manage the the looks. Well, what look is that coming over? Yes. Yes. Poof, I'm, ex- I'm exhausted for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. So that's just a glimpse into my everyday, you know, as a, when I travel. So, What does adventure mean to you? So I think for me, adventure, of, adventure means pushing yourself into a space that's either like an emotional space, a physical space, or mind space that is scary. For you, and so I've stopped. I've long stopped associating adventure with actually like expeditions and physical kind of. You know, I'm going to. I'm trekking to the South Pole, so I'm an adventurer. I've actually started looking at adventure as something more nuanced than that. If it, if it means living in a culture that's the polar opposite of your culture and trying to navigate it, to me that's that's kind of an emotional adventure as well. So for me, adventure is anything that pushes you or any experience that pushes you either emotionally, mentally, or physically out of your comfort zone. One of the things um, that we haven't sort of talked upon, uh, talked about yet is, um, is your writing. So you, you wrote an incredible book called Due North, which was the 2018 gold winner for best travel book. And I'd love for you to share a little bit more about, about the book Due North and you know, where the idea came from and you know, how it evolved. So that book is um, a really dear project. <laughs> you know, it's a really dear to my heart. It's a collection of stories and experiences from over 20 years of travel. And so what I did was I divided it to North, South, East and West. And, you know, um, it's pretty much like lots of snippets. So stories maybe I've written somewhere else before, like s- stories I wrote in my journal, stories that maybe some people haven't read before. But what I wanted to show is how do I navigate the world as objectively as I can through my eyes as an African traveler, black woman? How does the world interact with me? How do I interact with the world? And a lot of those experiences aren't shared in this kind of mainstream way. And so I really wanted to put a book out there that showed this is how I navigate the world, you know, as an African woman. And so, and then it's of course filled with a lot of my photos as well, you know, from different experiences. And it kind of ends with me in Sweden and how I got to Sweden. So, tell me a little bit more about the North Pole. What was that yes. dream? <laughs> so, so, the North Pole is is still that elusive dream, and I and I hope I get to it in my lifetime. But even if if I never do, I've made peace with that. <laughs> No, but um, I've always, like I said, again, going back to that geography and that love for geography, in growing up in Nigeria, that was my subject, you know, and I've always, like, looked at the North Pole and said, this is a place I really want to go, you know, I just want to explore it because this is a tangible place, this is a place that I've read about for so long, and so there were so many kind of different opportunities 
that kind of tr- tr- showed up over the years. So there was an um, there was a competition that was going to send a writer to the North Pole. And this was very early on. It was one of those kind of voting competitions, which I've sworn I'll never do anymore. <laughs> but back then, what we had to do was get as many votes as possible to be a finalist. And I missed that by only three votes. And out of thousands, I missed it by only three votes. And what that experience taught me, beyond being grateful you know, for all the people that voted, was people started admitting, even friends, admitted that they did not vote because they did not understand why I wanted to go to the North Pole. And for me, that actually spawned my TEDx talk, (laughs) which is called The Power of Asking Why Not. Now, why not? Why am I not allowed to go to the North Pole? Did they not see me in that space? And so that really spawned that kind of talk and a deeper reflection of, me asking people, when somebody asks me why, then I ask them why not. And not in a challenging way, but I want them to re-examine their own prejudices or their own reasons or their own limitations or their own biases as to why they feel I am not allowed in a space. So that's a roundabout way of talking about the North Pole, but it really treads a lot of the work I do and really um, informed like my last uh, TEDx talk about the power of asking why not. It's actually really sad when you said that, you know, you, you even had friends who didn't vote for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, it should, you know, it, it is heartbreaking sometimes because it's the, you, you do expect your friends to be the, the people who support you, who if there is a vote, who vote for you, who take the two minutes. And I understand it is a pain voting on those things. I, I don't do them anymore because I just find them horrendous. Yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, d- yeah, disappointing. Yeah, no, it was disappointing. And the thing that I realised, you know, as, again, I'll never do those kinds of voting things. I, I don't like them. But but now what I realised over the years, uh, you know, as with more maturity and insight is that, People can only see as far for you as they see from themselves. So if they do not see themselves accomplishing what it is you're trying to do, how could they ever fully understand it? And so that's when you start realizing friends, you need to have friends in different aspects of your life, right? You know, they they can be in different parallels, but not all of those friends are going to evolve with you as you evolve through your own life. Because sometimes they have ceilings, of what they see them their own selves accomplishing and they try to put those ceilings on you. And the only person that needs to be putting ceilings on you is you. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that is one of the things that I also learned from this experience as well. I think one of the, in, instead of using the words, the word ceilings, um, the, the word I would use is, um, is, is fears. So it can, mm. it can be interesting when you talk about your dreams, goals and ambitions with, with certain individuals and, and almost straight away when they start sharing back or communicating back, it's almost like they're revealing their fears. And they're, not, mm. they're not necessarily worried about you, but it, it, in their head, they're sort of like, oh, well, what about this risk? What about that? What about, you know, X, Y and Z? And it's actually got nothing to do with you. It's literally they're, they're voicing their, their fears and putting that ceiling on top of them. It, but when you realize that, it's actually really fascinating because then you can almost just, you know, listen, appreciate what they've said, and then mm-hmm. politely ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And also know that then those are not the people you want to ask favors from. <laughs> so Yeah, I think sometimes when you do have these... Um, big dreams and goals you've got to be I I know that I'm very very selective with the first sort of people that I mention it to you know you know you've got like that flicker of an idea it's almost like a candle inside you but it's not that bright yet and I just think I know if I share that with some individuals they'll just blow it out stamp on it (laughs) but like not not in a malicious way but just as in a you know a way but then there are other people who will sort of nurture it and help you to grow that flame and to build your confidence to to take that next step. Exactly, exactly. And I'm just to add, you know, one of the things I feel I'm gr- really grateful for is I am an optimistic idealist. That is actually who I am as a person. So it's very, like when people try to blow out that flame, it's actually very difficult for them to do because I operate from a very 
frustratingly idealistic point of view, <laughs> you know, and I'm very optimistic. And so so that also can be tied to personality, you know, where I feel like if, um, you know, I need to guard this. And there are many ideas I guard as well. And uh, but over the years, knowing that it's good, it's very difficult for people to blow out that idea just because just my own personality anyway. I just, oh, OK, <laughs> you know, I just keep moving. So. Was it challenging for you to make the decision to move to Sweden? Um, so it wasn't too challenging, I think, because so when I met my husband, my husband is Swedish. And when we met, he was working a job that required him to be in Sweden. So he was in Swedish media, which meant he had to be in Sweden. And at the time I was working as a programmer, which meant I could work remotely and from anywhere in the world. So that was the, I would say that was the only reason that I moved to Sweden in terms of him not moving to the U.S., you know, um, and we are just living there. So that was actually why I knew not much about Sweden. I wasn't like, like eye on my radar. It wasn't like, a, ooh, I, I, you know, I want to live here now. You know, it's my home and I've explored it and, and I know it, you know. But back then it was more of like, okay, what's the most convenient for our new marriage, new situation, new life? And that was why I came here. Yeah. Do you speak Swedish now? Yes, I do. Crappily, but yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Because you've actually you've written um, an amazing book, and I'm going to obviously butcher the pronunciation, but Lagom, Swedish Secret of Living Well. Um, and I'd love for you to A, pronounce the title properly, um, <laughs> and, and B, just tell everybody a little bit more about how this book came about and share a few of the insights um, on the secrets of living well. Yes, absolutely. So uh, the title is pro- uh, pronounced Logom. And the reason why this came about was in 2017. Actually, the year before that, there was a whole cr- a Scandinavian craze, like Scandinavian lifestyle craze that was sweeping the UK and then the world. And it was this Danish uh, Danish word called Ige, right? And so everybody wanted to know what this was. It's about being cozy and, you know, content. And so the world was looking for the next Scandinavian lifestyle trend to jump on. So they looked at Sweden and said, hmm, Sweden have this word called logon. Let's grab it. But um, logon is actually a mindset. It's not just like a word or just a, you know, like uh, it doesn't just explain a moment. It actually permeates the Swedish way of living in all aspects of society. So you know, people usually say to understand law, gum, is to understand the Swedish way of thinking and moving through the world. And so why I wrote this book was, one, the publisher reached out directly to me because they had found an article I wrote three years prior called The Silence of the Swedes. <laughs> that was an in-depth kind of journalistic uh, article. And so they wanted me to write this lifestyle book, you know, but I told them, yes, I'm going to write the lifestyle book, but more from a society mindset approach. It's not going to be like a baking buns or cinnamon buns. It's not that kind of book. This is a book that really truly um, goes into the mindset, pulls out, tries to understand it, and then gives you tips on maybe these are some things you can learn that can make your life better. And maybe some these are some things you don't, maybe you don't want to learn, you know, and just keep going. And just to kind of sum it up, uh, so logon, it's usually described as not too little, not too much, just right. But it actually uh, is the Swedish way of handling stress. So if you think of a scale, too much stresses the scale, too little stresses the scale. So a logon mindset tries to put sustainable habits in place so that that scale is always balanced and manageable. So that is what it is in a nutshell. 2020 has been quite a stressful year, I think, for uh, for a lot of people with the pandemic, with COVID-19, and possibly even more so for you being a travel photographer and being in the travel industry. How have you been impacted and, and how have you managed? Mm. So, yes, as a travel photographer, I can't go anywhere. A lot of those assignments have been postponed or cancelled. The good thing is I never put all eggs in one basket. And so that's just one part of what I do. And then the great thing is, since that space of travel photography is on hold until next year, I've actually started working on a company and an initiative to actually help portions of the travel industry. 
because people aren't traveling and the travel guides, you know, most of them have lost their jobs and the vendors, you know, the artisans we meet, they've lost revenue. We are now creating a solution, an, an experience-based solution that will allow guides to also get those jobs back as well as get artisans some in, um, income remotely. So that's something cool that I'm working on to help the travel industry. And, uh, and, and just in that sense, you know, I've been going back to things I really love, like writing, you know, or, or working with different commercial clients. So the travel aspects, you know, yes, I can travel for the photography assignments, but that wasn't um, under, like that wasn't hundred percent my income because I started diversifying very early on in my career. So very sensible. <laughs> <laughs> What advice would you have for women who, you know, would want to get into into the, the writing and the travel and the outdoor space? You know, what would be your best, what would be your sort of top tips and best pieces of advice? So one of the things I always give is, so when I was starting out, I tried to be a generalist. You know, I tried to write about anything and everything and so that I could just get those bylines. But you know what? Now the time to be a generalist is gone. People are now looking for more deeper, nuanced stories. So my advice would be is to find your niche and start growing and owning your voice in that niche. It might take some time, but that is how you start building strength and kind of creating your own vertical within whatever industry. So, for example, I have a friend, you know, uh, Joanna Logan, and she has created this whole kind of um, niche in terms of sustainable travel writing and storytelling. And she's got this thing called Rooted Storytelling. You know, that is a platform. And she started building and started creating that niche for herself. So getting into a space, you want to get into the space, but then start look, realizing, okay, what is a nat- natural niche for me in the space? And one of the things I always say is, if you're still looking for your niche, what are the things you love to do that you can do both at home and when you travel? If you can find that item that you can do both at home and when you travel, then that's the semblance of your niche that you love. And that's where you want to kind of start exploring within the travel space. So, Apart from um, the North Pole, which other countries have you got on your sort of um, bucket list that you want to go and visit and travel? I know that's obviously a very big, difficult question, but <laughs> but maybe just a few of like the dream places. Mm, mm. Well, I, I really love like polar, you know, the polar regions. So I would love to go to Antarctica and the Falkland Islands, you know. Uh, of course, not poor. And one of my dreams, I mean, I've been to Fiji, I've been to um, South Pacific, but one of my dreams is actually to just go island hopping for like a couple months across all the islands there in the South Pacific. That would be a dream. You know, go from Vanuatu to Samoa to Fiji to you know to Tahiti, like just island up all of them for a couple of months. That that would be a lovely, nice kind of dream trip. So. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'm I'm feeling so relaxed already. I'm literally imagining myself <laughs> island hopping in oh, the yeah. warmth and the amazing sunshine. Oh, and just beautiful water and everything, and people, and of course the culture. I mean, I'm all about the culture, so yeah, <laughs> that would, that would be a dream. How are you in in the cold? So I know you went uh, snowshoeing in Greenland. How was that experience? <laughs> we actually went uh, snowshoeing in a blizzard. <laughs> so <that was> crazy. <laughs> no, but um, I actually quite enjoy cold weather. You know, I've been living in a kind of a northern climate for a long time. I I don't do that well in very warm, and I don't, and that's why I feel like you know the body adapts to wherever you live for a long time. So I do enjoy cold climate. I've been, I've seen the northern lights. I've chased them, you know, in different places. I've been, um, you know, husky sledding, reindeer sledding, snowshoeing, lots of different cold kind of activities. I'm not so much of a skier. I'm not a big skier, <laughs> you know, but but I think other kind of cold, you know, uh, activities, you know, I enjoy. And I, I do enjoy, and it's mostly because 
I'm really interested in indigenous cultures, you know, in those regions and as well as, you know, chasing the northern lights and learning. So Lola, you obviously, you know, you go on these incredible adventures and do these amazing challenges and you obviously take beautiful, stunning photos. Where is the best place for people to find more information about you and to follow along with your different adventures and journeys? Yes. So everything is linked from my website. So it's Akimade, A-K-I-N. M-A-D-E dot com. And from there, you can link over to my image bank of photos. You can link over to my writing. You can link over to my academy. I actually have an academy where I'm teaching courses, you know, self-guided courses on how to sell your photos, how to become a better storyteller, some free stuff there. And yeah, so all my projects, as well as my agency I run, so all my projects you can get from akimade.com. And then I'm, of course, on social media, and tell us just about your geo traveler media as well dot com is that because that that's one of your companies as well isn't it yeah so that's my agency and it's my umbrella agency for a lot of all my kind of visual storytelling activities you know so through that agency I run the academy you know i i uh, it's also registered as a publisher so I can self publish books as well you know I uh, do collaborations with different brands you know do influencer marketing you know so it's and as well as manage my image bank. So it's my umbrella company, you know, and I work with a lot of kind of independent contractors, you know, uh, to to do different things or work on different projects. But that is what Geo Traveler Media is. Fantastic. And Lola, I'd love for you to have like the final words. So the final words of advice for other women out there who want to take more photos, who want to travel more and they want to follow their passions. What What advice would you have for them? If anything, the pandemic has shown us is that, you know, life is quite fleeting. I I know it's cliche to say that, but um, now is the time to show up the real you to show up, you know. So if there's something you've always been burning to do, now is the time to start exploring it. Now is the time to start saying no more and start saying yes to yourself, self-care. But just realizing that this is this time is for you and it's okay to fully step into being who you are and coming out to, you know, following your dreams. So so that's what I'll say is, you know, it's too late to be somebody else. Be fully who you are, authentically who you are, and then start following your passions and what keeps your soul burning. Oh, absolutely. Lola, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast. It's been absolutely amazing to speak with you. And I um, hope you have an incredible 2021. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks for having me. Happy New Year, Tribe 2021. Can you believe it? My name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl podcast and the founder of Tough Girl Challenges, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. New episodes of the Tough Girl podcast go live on a Tuesday and Thursday at 7 a.m. UK time. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out. Everything that we have talked about today with Lola will be available in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. So please do go and check it out. We have got an incredible lineup to kickstart 2021. We are going to be speaking with Alice Deering, Renata Chumlunska, Nazia Katoum, Katie Holmes, Jenny Brown, Lauren Woodworth to start. Um, that is just a few of the examples of the amazing women who are going to be coming on the Tough Girl podcast to share more about their lives, their challenges, their journeys, what they've learned along the way with the goal of motivating and inspiring you and also increasing the amount of female role models in the media. If you'd like to support the mission of Tough Girl Challenges, then please do go and visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash tough girl podcast you can sign up from two dollars a month five dollars a month ten dollars a month there's also the option to sign up in euros and sterling there's a monthly option and an annual option or you can alternatively just make a one-off donation via paypal all the links are on the website toughgirlchallenges.com thank you again for all of your incredible support i hope you have an amazing 2021 and i will speak to you next week take care lots of love bye